This is Have You Met? My guest today is a marine wildlife conservation and environmental activist. He co-founded Greenpeace and is the founder of the Sea Shepherd Conservation Society. This master mariner has spent most of his career on the water, often risking his own life to protect the crew of Spaceship Earth, the wildlife that we simply cannot live without. He's won more prestigious awards than I can list. He's in the US Animal Rights Hall of Fame and he's been awarded the Amazon Peace Prize. We talk about sinking illegal fishing boats, what it's like to be a wanted man, if humans need to eliminate fish from our diet, if the Dalai Lama is a good lunch date, and much, much more. Have you met? Paul Watson. So Paul, tell me a little bit about your early life and about how that set you on course to do what you've done and and what what you're doing now. Well, I was born and raised in uh, Canada. And um, when I was about uh, nine years old, I, you know, spent a summer swimming with a family of uh, beavers uh, in New Brunswick. And uh, in, then, you know, I was quite excited to go back the next summer to, to swim with the, the beavers that I had met. But uh, when I went back, I found out that they were gone. And I found out that trappers had taken them all out during the winter. And that made me quite angry. So... That winter, when I began to walk the, the trap lines uh, and uh, free the animals and destroy the traps. So uh, that's when I started, and I guess I've been doing the same thing ever since. <laughs> wow. How old were you then? How old were you when you first swam with the beavers? Uh, 10. You were 10. And so you were, what, 11 when you're going around and like destroying the traps and stuff? Right, yes. Wow. So, I mean, take me back to that age. So, at that age, did you understand everything about it or were you, you were just purely just angry? Well, I was a, a member of a group that, uh, called the Kindness Club. Now, it's really uh, interesting that the, the wife of the conservative premier of New Brunswick, Ida Fleming, she set up this group called the uh, Kindness Club, which was basically to teach children to be kind to animals. And uh, I got to know her quite well later. And uh, when I was, uh, oh, I think about 18 or so, uh, she, she called me the hitman for the Kindness Club. So, you know, so that had a lot of influence on it. My grandfather also had a lot of influence, my mother. Uh, but um, yeah, so, but I also I was raised in a, a, a semi-wilderness area. You know, I was raised in a fishing village in Eastern Canada. Yeah. Okay. So did you always have a love of animals, like in your family and everything like that? Yeah. And a lot of exposure as a child to, you know, whales and dolphins, seals and seabirds wow. and things. Yeah. Wow. I lived uh, I lived on Passamaquoddy Bay, which has the highest tides in the world. Uh, and, uh, you know, it's 110 foot tides in the springtime. And uh, so there's a lot of, uh, you know, a lot of wildlife. Wow. That's amazing. So you, were your family ever involved with the fishing industry or anything down there when you grew up? No, no, no it, just uh, observers. No, my father was a, a chef uh, in my, uh, no, so no, not involved. Yeah. Okay, cool. Because you said it was a fishing village. When was your first time on a boat? Well, I, I used to actually spend uh, my um, uh, lunch hours as a child, like seven, eight, nine uh, on the um, mail boat uh, at, the, at the dock in St. Andrews, New Brunswick, you know, so I used wow. to, so it wasn't going anywhere, but, it, but, but then of course it was on the ferries and that, but uh, the first time I actually um, worked on a boat was uh the Princess Marguerite, the ferry between uh, Victoria and Seattle. And then I was in the Canadian Coast Guard. Then I joined the Norwegian Merchant Marine. And I worked in the Swedish Merchant Marine. Uh, so, so, so really started around 17. Yeah. So truly a career on the water, like a lifetime on the water. Yeah. <laughs> have, you, have you ever had a job that wasn't like <laughs> involved with being on the water? Well, I did, uh, you know, as a young, I, I left home a very early. So, yeah, I did things like... Uh, I planted trees in British Columbia, you know, and uh, yeah, oh, you know, just different, different odd jobs around here. I always thought that was quite valuable to get uh, some experience in everything, like whether, whether it be painting or carpet uh, laying or you know things like that. Yeah, practical skills. Mm-hmm. Cool. And so, how did you go from from you know your younger years, like swimming with beavers and and you know all these different odd jobs, to co-founding Greenpeace? How what was that kind of transition period like? What what were the big events uh, between then? Well, I came off of a um, of a Norwegian uh, ship that I was working on in Vancouver, and just in time for there was a demonstration at the border uh, uh, between Washington State and British Columbia at the place called the Peace Arch uh, Park, 
And it was a demonstration organized by the Sierra Club and the Quakers. And it was against nuclear testing in Amchika Island uh, in, the, in the Aleutians. And um, my reason get for getting involved was different than everybody else's. Uh, as Quakers, it was for peace. The Sierra Club, it was environment. But Amchika was a wildlife preserve. And you couldn't take a gun onto the island. That was illegal. But here they are blowing a five megaton bomb up underneath of it. And uh, previous tests, killed quite a number of sea otters and sea lions and that. So that was my motivation to get involved. But uh, out of that demonstration, we formed a group called uh, the Don't Make a Wave Committee. And that was because people still remember the 1964 Anchorage earthquake, which caused a tidal wave to hit Vancouver Island and also Hawaii. And so that was we wanted to put that image into people's heads that nuclear testing could cause a tidal tidal wave. And that. so that's why we called it the Don't Make a Wave Committee. But at one of the early meetings, um, Somebody left and flashed a peace sign and uh, said peace. And Bill Darnell, uh, one of our members, then said, uh, uh, make it a green peace. And uh, Bob Hunter said, hey, that's a great name for the boat. So <laughs> we uh, named the boat the green peace. So the, the boat came before the organization. Go then ahead. in 1972, uh, we formally established Greenpeace and uh, changed the name from Don't Make a Wave Committee to the Greenpeace Foundation. We actually took the name Foundation because we were science fiction fans. We took it from Isaac Asimov's Foundation Trilogy. <laughs> and But the, th the, the reason for Greenpeace's success was that uh, it was put together by, you know, they like to, they'd like to say that it was put together by a bunch of hippies and everything, which just wasn't true at all. <laughs> it, was, uh, it was actually formed primarily by journalists, broadcasters, and uh, communications people. I was majoring in communications at the time. Bob Hunter was a columnist for the Vancouver Sun. Ben Metcalf was working for the CBC. Uh, so it was really the first environmental organization to um, understand uh, that we lived in a media culture mm -hmm. and that if we're going to uh, get our message across, we had to understand the, the culture that we were living in, how to use the media to our advantage. I also had the um, advantage in that uh, as a communication major at Simon Fraser University, we had a guest lecturer uh, named uh, Marshall McLuhan. And uh, he sort of is, a, is the, the guru of uh, communications, really. Uh, he wrote, uh, I don't know if you're familiar with him, but he wrote the book Mechanical Bride, Gutenberg Galaxy, The Media is a Massage. And what he, was, uh, what he was saying is that the media is more important than the message it conveys. You have to understand mm -hmm. the power of that particular media. Uh, one of the reasons Seaspiracy was so effective is not so much because it was a documentary put together by Ali Tabrizi, as so much as the fact that it was on Netflix, <laughs> you know, yeah. I mean, otherwise you're just preaching the converted, but if you can get it onto something like Netflix, then you're reaching millions of people, which who, who would otherwise not be exposed to the message. So what we learned there was how do you get the attention of the medium and really have to get the media what the media wants and uh, mm -hmm. media is not interested in facts and figures. They're not there to educate you. They're there to, um, to entertain. <laughs> so yeah. uh, the media only understand there's only four elements to every story in the mainstream media, only four elements. And those four elements are sex, scandal, violence, and celebrity. If it doesn't have one of those elements, it isn't a story. If it has all four elements, super story. So uh, we understood that, you know, that you had to dramatize your, uh, what you were doing in order to get the attention of people. Whereas Bob Hunter once said, uh, if it means standing on our head and, you know, quacking like a duck to get their attention, then that's what we'll do. <laughs> yeah, no, that's that's absolutely correct. Yeah, you do need to, to make a scene, don't you? Because otherwise nothing gets on the TV. I mean, it's kind of ridiculous watching the, the news a lot of the time, isn't it? I don't know if you ever do that. Like I sit, I sit down sometimes and have the new, the 24 news channel or the headlines come on and it's just bizarre sometimes the the order of things and the things in which they they say <laughs> it used to be mainstream news or isn't anymore i mean in the days i don't know if you're familiar with walter cronkite when he was a you vaguely know, you know, an anchor for cbs news uh and the same with the bbc at the, at the time they gave you the news there was no emotion there was no opinion there was uh, it was just pure fact and you could really come to your own conclusions on that but today it's all like opinions and politics and uh, everybody's got a, a bias. <laughs> There's mm -hmm. real objective reporting. Yeah. But uh, we could see that that was going that way a long time ago. Uh, yeah. In 1977, um, you know, we had been opposing the Canadian seal hunt for, for some time and, you know, getting a little bit of attention here. But 1977, we seized on an opportunity, which was to bring Bridget Bardot to the ice flows of uh, of um, off of Labrador in Newfoundland. And 
That guaranteed us the cover of every major magazine in the world, Bunter Stern, Perry Match. Um, and that's so what we realize again, the media is more important than the story. Bridget Bardot is more important, but she could get her message across. She was against the, uh, the killing of the seals. And she knew that by, by coming there and posing cheek to cheek with a baby seal, that people would pay attention to what they were doing. So that was one of our first real successful media campaigns. And since then, we've, uh, you know, for instance, um, I led a campaign against the killing of wolves in British Columbia in 1984. And it's an example of the perfect story with all four elements, because the government was killing wolves from helicopters, violence, the, uh, the, the people of the rednecks who lived up there were threatening to kill us, more violence. The environment minister uh, had taken a bribe, which we exposed from the Big Game Hunting Association, which was scandal. So we had violence and scandal. So to round it all up, I, I recruited uh, Bo Derek as our spokesperson for the campaign. And at the press conference, uh, which was packed, um, you know, a Vancouver Sun reporter said to me, come on, what's Bo Derek know about wolves? This is stupid, Happy Tur is your spokesperson. I said, well, I don't know. You guys make the rules. We don't play the games. If I had Dr. Gordon Haber or Dr. David Meck, the two foremost wolf biologists in the world here today, nobody would be paying attention, would they? But you know what? You're going to write the story. The story is going to be the front page of your newspaper tomorrow. And there's not a damn thing you can do about it, is there? <laughs> yeah. So you beat them at their own game, basically. Just play the game. Yeah, that's right. Uh, you know, today we have a, a, we have a board of uh, celebrity advisors. Uh, mm. So I always say, you know, we have, because we had uh, Sean Connery, and we have Pierce Brosnan, we have uh, um, oh, uh, Richard Dean Anderson and uh, William Shatner and uh, Christian Bale. I mean, how can we lose? We got Batman, we got Captain Kirk, we got two James Bonds, we have MacGyver, and we have the somewhat, some people think was the president of the United States. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, not a bad, uh, not a bad list. <laughs> um talk to me about like uh when you were with greenpeace what was your first uh kind of or not first your most memorable let's say campaign with greenpeace oh well i, I think that i led the campaigns against the seal hunt in 1976 and 77 and uh so those are the campaigns that i organized against a lot of greenpeace resistance they didn't want me to to actually mm -hmm. do that campaign, but I raised some money, did it, and, uh, and and that proved to be quite 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 successful. So that was a those campaigns that I was most uh, proud of. Why didn't they want you to do it? Why didn't some of the other Greenpeace members want you to do it? He, Greenpeace went through uh, a few schisms. Uh, the first one was the fact that uh, we in 1974 we got involved with protecting whales. And that's all fine and good, but the Quaker element, that is the other half of uh, that is the peace side of Greenpeace. Mm -hmm. They didn't want anything to do with that. You know, they were there all time. They were against nuclear weapons. They were against war. Okay. Uh, and they're Quakers. But here's the other thing. The, the Yankee whaling fleet was all run by the Quakers back in this. <laughs> all oh, right. <laughs> yeah. but, so they didn't want anything to do with that. They, you know, they were human oriented. They didn't want anything to do with whales. So that was the first big schism with Greenpeace. And most of those Quakers dropped out at that time. So then uh, we got involved with whales, Paul Spong and Bob Hunter and, uh, we, and myself. And, uh, uh, and then when I said, we got to do something about seals, then, you know, Paul Spong said, well, you know, it's just going to detract from the whale thing. And now we're not going to do that. And I said, well, I'll just go out and raise the money and do it myself. So I did. And then after, you know, I got, got a lot of publicity, then they uh, said, yeah, it's a good, they, they all joined in. Yeah. <laughs> okay. And how come things or, or how did things kind of reach the, the end with you and like your involvement with Greenpeace? Or are you still involved in some way now? No, I haven't been involved since 77. Not actively, no. But the, the, the politics of it were this. Uh, so, you know, Bob Hunter was the uh, really the visionary father of Greenpeace. I mean, if it wasn't for Bob Hunter, there would be no Greenpeace today. And uh, But he was stepping down and being replaced by Patrick Moore. And Patrick Moore was your establishment kind of guy. And uh, he had a problem with me on the SEAL campaign, uh, on the 77 SEAL campaign. Because first of all, I didn't I didn't want him on my crew. But he came on as a, the vice president of Greenpeace. He insisted on coming, so he came. Uh, and then I was taking Bridget Bardot out to the ice, and he said, well, I, he wanted to get in the helicopter and go out with her. I said, no, you're not getting in the helicopter. You're not a photographer. You're not a cameraman. I don't need you. And he said, well, let me put it this way. If I'm not in that helicopter, when I become president, you're out the door. I said, well, let me put it this way. You're not getting in the helicopter. <laughs> and uh, so uh, 
That was in March of 77. Well, in June of 77, he became president of Greenpeace. Then he called a meeting and he had me dismissed uh, from the board of directors, not from Greenpeace, but from the board of directors, because he accused me of violence and theft. Because during the SEAL campaign in 77, I walked up to a sealer, pulled a club out of his hand, threw it in the water. He says, you stole that man's property. You destroyed his property, you know. And I said, well, you know, I went there. I saved a SEAL's life that, uh, in that incident. I said, I was there to save SEALs. I don't know what you were there for. But, um, you know, uh, if I had to do it over again, I'd do it over again. He says, well, I don't think you understand what Greenpeace is all about. I said, well, obviously not what it's become. It's interesting that Patrick Moore, uh, he was president of Greenpeace Canada well, until the early 80s. Today, he works for, um, he works for the uh, chemical industry, Monsanto, uh, the mining industry, completely sold out. He's become a multimillionaire by his whole shtick is like, uh, uh, as a former president of Greenpeace, I wouldn't be supporting this if it wasn't good for the environment. You know, no way. fortune off of this. But anyway, but the other interesting thing is about uh, everybody from those days, uh, Bob Hunter, Ron Precious, Rob Marining, they all left Greenpeace. There's not a single founding member of Greenpeace here today. And most of them joined Sea Shepherd and sailed mm-hmm. on Sea Shepherd campaigns. So I don't know if you're familiar with uh, Isaac Asimov's foundation trilogy. It's actually not overly, unfortunately. Yeah, the, it's actually showing on um, on uh, what is it? Uh, Apple TV now, I think. Uh, they, oh, cool. they've got it on. Uh, they finally made a movie about it. But in it is the foundation was set up to protect the, the, the galactic universe, the science fiction thing. But unbeknownst to the foundation, the second foundation was set up. And the second foundation's role was to keep the first foundation, watch it, keep it in line. And in a way, that's what Sea Shepherd had became. It was a second foundation. Uh, and it, it got to the point where Bob, uh, one of the Greenpeacers called up Bob Hunter, he says, can you get, can you get Sea Shepherd to, to do an oil tanker campaign? And he said, why? Because if he does it, then I can get the funding from Greenpeace to do it. Because, see, they were basically copying everything that we did. In 1981, we went up to Soviet Siberia to give evidence on illegal whaling operations and got a lot of publicity. They did. They went up and copied the whole campaign in 82, got in a lot of trouble, got arrested and everything. But uh, they got more publicity because they have a bigger media machine. But then when we did, uh, we, we were the first to go to the to, to the ice to spray the seals with an organic dye to destroy this. So they went and did this thing next year. So they, they seemed to be copying everything we did. And I said, don't you guys, can't you come up with any ideas of your own you know, on this? Yeah. But so, but the problem was that Greenpeace became this, uh, uh, I don't know, this big super feel good organization. People join it to feel good, really. But uh, it doesn't really do much because it's afraid to do anything. I mean, you, they, the, the Esperanza is a $50 million ship. You know, you don't risk a $50 million ship on a campaign. I don't mind risking my ships because they're all replaceable. And unless you're willing to take that risk, then you're not going to accomplish anything. Yeah. So it was largely the inactivity, I guess, that, that pushed you to want to do something more involved, more on the front lines, I suppose. Well, yeah, I said to Pat, we're more on the board. I said, I'll just go start my own organization. He said, well, you're never, you're nothing without Greenpeace. And I said, well, we'll see about that. But the interesting thing about it in 1979 is that I hunted down, rammed and, and put the uh, pirate whaler Sierra out of, out of commission, ended its career. Rex Weiler published my story and photographs in the Greenpeace Chronicles in 79. This is like a couple of years after I was dismissed for violence and whatever. Mm. Well, we published uh, So, it, you know, we got this front page story, full page spread in the Greenpeace Chronicles about what I did. And then they were putting together Greenpeace International and Bob Hunter asked me to come to Vancouver. So I'm actually a founding director of, uh, of, of Greenpeace International in 1979, even though Greenpeace says I was dismissed in 77. But it was because of the setting up of Greenpeace International and where they decided that uh, David McTaggart would be the, the president of Greenpeace International. That's when Patrick Moore left and he had a big fight with McTaggart. He left and that's when he sold out. Uh, Bob, Bob called him the uh, eco Judas. I just called him a corporate whore. <laughs> You mentioned the seal thing where you were like going to put the dye in their fur to mm-hmm. make the, the fur less attractive to the people that were clubbing them and whatever, killing them. Um, I remember I watched, I, th- I can't remember, I think it was in maybe your Watson documentary or something that somebody made about you. Um, but you went there, I think maybe the first time you went there to do the, the fur. And one of the people in your team, like you were all ready to go and do it. And one of them kind of decided to just give the dye back to the locals, right? Is that yeah, that's... My- that's what Pat Moore and um, Bob Hunter made the decision to not do that. 
And that's why I said that the next year that both Bob and Pat weren't invited, weren't allowed to participate in the campaign. Yeah. But yeah, so, uh, it was originally my idea with Greenpeace, but I wasn't allowed to do it with Greenpeace. So the yeah. interesting thing, it did, I did it in 79 with Sea Shepherd. Greenpeace did it in 1980. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> did you ever find out, did they ever say to you like why they did that in that moment, gave that die back? They, they were afraid of the sealers. You know, when we, yeah. when we arrived in Newfoundland, we were met by hundreds of sealers, you know, and they had hangman's nooses and they were threatening and everything and the Mounties weren't doing anything. Uh, and um, they backed down to them. I said, no, you know, we don't have to back down to these guys, but Bob and Pat yeah. were scared of the fact that these guys were, you know, out of control. And, yeah. Um, David Garrick and I, who are the actual leaders of the campaign, uh, we, we didn't back. We were pretty unhappy with the whole thing. Yeah. Right. I mean, watching the footage, I could see how hard that was for you. Like when, uh, yeah, Bob, is it Bob Hunter that gave the die back? Yeah, um, but it was mainly under Patrick Moore's urging, uh, really. Mm, uh, yeah. Uh, I could before, see your face, though, like not happy before, with that. The year before, pa Bob and I uh, stood in front of a, of a Norwegian sealing ship and stopped it cold in the ice. Uh, so, yeah. you know, Bob, Bob, Bob always had the, uh, the courage to do what needed to be done, but he was also... He was also somewhat manipulated in a way by, by, by Patrick Moore, who was trying to, I don't know, create Greenpeace as some sort of respectable mm. <laughs> organization. I said, well, we've got enough respectable organizations like the Sierra Club. We don't need another copy of what they do. Yeah, sometimes respectable doesn't get it done, I guess. Yeah. Um, so we, we've established how Sea Shepherd started. So you, well, pretty much. Was there anything else to that story after what you said? I mean, in terms of founding it, like how long after you left Greenpeace did it? Did you start well, left, Sea Shepherd? I left Greenpeace in June of 77. But, um, you know, I didn't have any money or anything like that. So what I did was um, uh, I contacted Cleveland Amory of the Fund for Animals and uh, told him I wanted to do a campaign to protect the seals and would he support it? And he said, yes. So... He said, what do you need? I said, I need a ship. <laughs> so uh, he gave me the money. I went to uh, Hull in Yorkshire and found a side trawler there. Uh, now, I had the money to buy the ship, which I did, but I didn't have the money for the campaign. So I went to, um, uh, <laughs> to the RSPCA and they gave me the money. So I always thought it was so funny because we were considered this radical extreme group, but we were funded by two of the more conservative groups in the world, RSPCA and Fund for Animals yeah cuddly uh, rspca seem cuddly when you think of them and and they're funding you uh these big bad uh sea shepherds <laughs> <laughs> yeah they were you know, I, I was always grateful for it. they had actually representatives on board the ship during that first campaign with sea shepherd yeah right? both from yeah. the animals and from the rspca and tell me a little bit like it will tell me exactly what sea shepherd do like if i know they there's lots of different things and you could be here for hours telling me what they do but if you had to kind of put a, a label on it for everybody listening watching this well the difference between greenpeace and sea shepherd is i set sea shepherd up to as an interventionist uh organization we're not going to protest we're not there to hang banners we're not there to bear witness that's greenpeace's approach we're there to intervene and mm -hmm. so i set up a strategy called aggressive nonviolence, which means that we're going to be aggressive but we're not going to hurt anybody and after 44 years we you know, nobody's been hurt and we've shut down hundreds and hundreds of illegal operations. Now, Greenpeace's accusation that I'm violent comes from the fact that we destroy property, but I have no problem with destroying property used for illegal activities. If an elephant poacher is about to shoot an elephant and he knocked the rifle out of his hand and break the rifle, is that an act of violence? To me, that's an act of nonviolence. A sentient life has been saved through the destruction of a non-sentient object. And yeah. uh, so Greenpeace disagrees with that, but that's, that's, that's my approach on that. You, I don't think you can commit an act of violence against a non-sentient object, but we no, live, especially in, in the context, sorry, carry on. And we live in a culture though, where uh, property has more value th than life. Yeah. And uh, I always illustrate it this way. Imagine walking into the city of Mecca, spitting on the black stone. You're not going to get out of that city alive. You'd be ripped to pieces. Walk up to the Wailing Wall in Tel Aviv with a pickaxe, start whacking away. You're going to get an Israeli bullet, a soldier's bullet in the back. Nobody's going to have any sympathy for you. Walk into Rome with a hammer, smash out the Pieta. You're in big trouble. But each and every day, 
We go into the most beautiful and sacred cathedrals of the natural world, the rainforests of Amazonia, the Great Barrier Reef off of Australia, and we totally desecrate and destroy those cathedrals. And how do we respond? Petitions, writing to the members of parliament, dress up in animal costumes and jump up and down with, uh, with signs. I mean, if the Great Barrier Reef, if the rainforests of Amazonia were as sacred to us, then we would, we would fight to protect them. And instead of, but we don't, we don't have, they're, they're, they have no value in our anthropocentric mindset. You know, the only things that have value are, are things ma that are man-made. Really. Another example is that a few years ago, a ranger in Zimbabwe shot and killed a poacher who was about to kill a black rhinoceros. And human rights groups around the world attacked him. How dare you take a human life to protect an animal? I think his answer illustrated the hypocrisy of our, of our societies. He said, you know, if I was, um, if I was a, a, a police officer in Harare and a man ran out of Bar Barclays Bank with a bag of money and I shot him in the head right in front of everybody, killed him, you'd call me a hero. Give me a medal. How is it that a bag of paper has more value than the future heritage of Zimbabwe? And I think that, that you know, that's really uh, illustrates the hypocrisy. Yeah. Definitely. It's powerful to think of it like that. Unfortunately, it is largely the way things seem to be. How many ships and or boats have you got in the Sea Shepherd fleet at the moment? Uh, ten right now. There's ten. ten. You no, know, we, we, it comes and goes. Sometimes we, we retire one and then we get another one and everything right now. But yeah. uh, we have uh, the Sam, our, our, our large vessels are the Sam Simon and the, and the Bob Barker which are yeah. engaged primarily uh, in protection, anti-poaching work off of West Africa. And uh, Sam Simon will be heading soon to the Bay of Biscay to protect dolphins from the French trawling fleet. Uh, in the Baltic, we have the Emmanuel Bronner. In the Mediterranean, we have the Conrad and the Sea Eagle, and they're go doing anti-poaching work. In the uh, Sea of Cortez, we have the Sharpie, the Farley Mowat, and the... Um, and, and the John Paul de Joria. Those are former U.S. Coast Guard patrol boats, and so they're they're engaged since 2015 in preventing the extinction of the vaquita porpoise, which I'm quite confident that would now be extinct if it wasn't for our interventions. We've confiscated 150,000 meters of illegal nets from uh, the vaquita refuge in the Sea of Cortez. And, we also, and then we have the Ocean Warrior, the vessel that we actually commissioned and had built. And uh, it just returned from um, documenting illegal activities by the Chinese fishing fleet uh, in the eastern tropical Pacific, uh, south of the Galapagos. But we also have a lot of campaigns that are not involving ships, like we have an anti-poaching uh, crew in Mayotte uh, to stop uh, uh, sea turtle poaching. We're cleaning up uh, remote beaches, northern Australia, Cocos Keeling Island, Cocos Island, things like that, uh, removing marine debris there so uh, the, the real thing the, the thing that i'm most proud of is sea shepherd uh, which was an organization is now a global movement and um, i sort of credit the japanese for that because they came after me personally in 2012 and as sea shepherd they came after sea shepherd in the u.s and uh then i realized something you can stop an individual or you can even shut down an organization but you can't stop a movement so now we're in 42 countries those 42 countries are all separate entities uh, that means that um, you say they shut down Sea Shepherd USA. Well, there's Sea Shepherd France or Sea Shepherd Germany. They can't sh shut them down. That's what happened in, in what happened in 2012 is that the Japanese came to the U.S. courts to seek an injunction against our activities in the Southern Ocean, which we thought was somewhat strange because we had Dutch registered ships operating out of Australian ports against Japanese vessels in Antarctica. And what's this got to do with the U.S. courts? But uh, and Judge Jones, uh, Richard Jones of the U.S. court, he, he agreed. He said to the Japanese, you come into my court with unclean hands. You're in contempt of court for the Australian federal court. You, you, you didn't pay the million dollar fine that they levied against you. And you come in here and want you want an injunction from me. I'm not going to give it to you. So we thought, you know, quite secure and going ahead with the campaign. But in December, after our ships had left, the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals in the U.S. gave them their injunction without any explanation just informed us there was a, an injunction. So we found ourselves in 21 counts of contempt of a federal injunction, but we went to court in November of 2013 and Judge Peter Shaw acquitted us. He, you know, eight days in court and he acquitted us. Fine, that was wonderful. A year later, Ninth Circuit Court of Appeal overturned the acquittal and found us guilty. We never talked to these guys. They never even looked at, our, um, at the evidence. They just overturned it, which I completely lost faith in the U.S. justice system on this because it's all political. 
Yeah. Uh, judge Alex, Alex Kaczynski, the head judge on this, hated environmentalists and made it perfectly clear that he did. The other two judges of the three judge panel, one was the only Japanese American judge on the panel and the other one was a Mormon. So, you know, they're very prejudiced against this. Now, here's what he did was he levied. Uh, he, he, he said to Sea Shepherd, you're going to have to pay damages. That's 50, 60 million dollars. And now the, that took the Japanese by surprise. They didn't want damages for a very good reason. Because to pay damages, they'd have to open up their books. And that was the last thing they wanted to do. So they came back to us and said, look, you don't have to pay damages. Just pay our legal fees. Okay, we paid two and a half million dollars legal fees. And the next day, we charged them with piracy. bringing it. They brought it into the U.S. courts. We carried it on in the U.S. courts. Now they have to open up their books. <laughs> But they didn't want to do that. And we figured it would cost us well, probably eight, $10 million to go forward with the case, which we didn't have. So, but they didn't know that. So we did mitigation with them and we made a deal with the Japanese. Okay, Sea Shepherd USA will honor the injunction, but not Sea Shepherd Australia, France, mm. Germany, New Zealand. So they, and then they gave us an undisclosed, I'm not allowed to say how much money they gave us but we came out pretty good on it. Uh, and so all they got out of it was that Sea Shepherd USA could not uh, intervene, but the, our campaigns can continue to go on. And uh, so they came after me personally too. Uh, they put me on the, I'm on Interpol red list for um, uh, the conspiracy to, com uh, to trespass. Now the Interpol red list is for serial killers, major war criminals, and, uh, major drug traffickers. Nobody in the history of that list has ever been put on there for trespassing, let alone conspiracy to trespass. <laughs> Japan's a powerful country. So they, 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 that's the reason I'm, I'm on there. So that's caused me some inconvenience, but also the, the realization that, again, they can come after me as an individual, but it's only made Sea Shepherd uh, stronger. Yeah. Uh, in the world. And, uh, and so it's all worked out uh, quite well. And in the end, we won. Japan's no longer killing whales in the Southern Ocean. Um, we ended up costing them $200 million in losses and we saved 6,500 whales. Yeah. That's not a bad day at the office. Um, that's quite a story though. Yeah. It's crazy how, yeah, you, you get off and then it just comes back on you. And yeah, I mean, it makes it quite clear that there is, there's corruption, isn't there within, in high places and things. Yeah. For all the names, always... all the names they call us and everything, none of them stuck. I mean, we've never been convicted of a felony crime. I was invited to give a lecture to the FBI uh, in Quantico, Virginia, and they actually paid me to come give a talk to them about eco-terrorism. <laughs> uh, and um, so one of the questions from the FBI, one of the special agents says, well, you know, uh, Sea Shepherd's walking a pretty fine line when it comes to the law. And I said, well, does it really matter how fine that line is as long as you don't actually cross the line? And he had to agree with me. But then he said, yeah, but some of your people have gone on to become eco-terrorists. I said, I have no idea what you're talking about. I said, who, who, who? And he said, Rod Coronado. I said, Rod Coronado was charged with liberating mink from a mink farm. Is that what you call eco-terrorism? And I said, he did that after he left Sea Shepherd. It's got nothing to do with us. And he said, well, you trained him. You're responsible. I said, you know, I got four names for you. Lee Harvey Oswell, Timothy McVeigh, Osama bin Laden, Muammar Gaddafi. You train them, you're responsible. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I bet that went down well. But yeah, that's true. Actually, it's ridiculous. Actually, to... actually, they, they, they all laughed. Actually. <laughs> <laughs> so they saw it. They saw they were defeated. Because, yeah, that's, uh, that's absurd, isn't it? Try and put that well, on here, you. The... <laughs> here's the interesting thing. Today, what we do is taught in the uh, U.S. Naval War College. And we are working with the U.S. Naval War Cards. We're working with uh, uh, the American Securities Project, which is John Kerry and, uh, and others and everything, because what they have seen with Sea Shepherd is a way to combat uh, illegal fishing. Yeah. And in 2015, we did the longest pursuit of a poacher in history with the chasing of the poacher thunder. Uh, it was caught in the waters of the Southern Ocean and... Uh, we sent two ships out of it, uh, the Bob Barker and the Sam Simon. It took eight days to find it. And as soon as we found uh, the Thunder, it dropped its nets, uh, or its gill net and ran. And that pursuit lasted 110 days. Now, the Sam Simon came in behind to confiscate that net, to pull it up. It took 110 hours to pull 72 kilometers of net from two kilometers down. That net weighed 70 tons. 
pulled that whole thing up and confiscated and put it on board and then joined into the chase, a chase which went up into the Indian Ocean around the Horn of Africa and to the waters of San Tomi and on equatorial West Africa. And there, after 110 days, the captain of the thunder sank his own ship right in front of us. And uh, we filmed the whole thing. And uh, we made this film called Chasing the Thunder about it. But uh, the reason he did that is that he had nowhere to go. We, yeah. Interpol was now working with us. And Interpol, we were to just keep Interpol apprised as to where that boat is. They'd be arrested as soon as they went in. So he sank the ship to destroy the evidence. But, mm. and he got off at the last minute, but three of my crew boarded uh, the sinking ship and got the evidence the computers, samples of fish, um, you know, cell phones, charts, logbooks. They got that. Uh, and then we rescued the 42 crew on board. Well, the captain and two officers ended up going for, to prison, the captain for three years, the two officers for two years, and the company was fined 17 million euros. And uh, we were able to repatriate the, um, the uh, crew who were primarily Indonesians who really weren't involved in it. They were just on the crew. You know, That's one of the big problems with these, these things of virtual slave labor on, the, on these vessels. Yeah. And, uh, yeah. So since then, we got invited by many countries to work with them. So today we have partnerships with Tanzania, uh, with Namibia, uh, Gabon, Gambia, San Tome, San, uh, Liberia, Togo, and um, Cabo Verde. And uh, we're now talking to South Africa about patrolling their waters. And so we've arrested 72 poaching vessels in West African waters. We shut down poaching off the waters of Tanzania. And uh, th this has been going really, really well. And now we're doing partnerships with uh, Peru, Panama, Colombia, and um, Mexico. In Mexico, we uh, actually Mexican sailors are on, armed Mexican sailors are on our boats. In Africa, it's armed uh, Gabonese or Liberian personnel who are on board. We don't carry weapons, but we do transport enforcement people who do. Now, what that means is we partnered our resources with their authority. Mm -hmm. So we provide the crew the, and, the, and the ships. They provide the enforcement, the, uh, the authority. And that works out really quite well. Now, and the U.S. government uh, has seen this and is, is now looking at it. Uh, now we're talking to Palau and some uh, southern Pacific islands about doing, doing the same thing. So we're trying to build up. Uh, this international uh, partnership with these various uh, with various governments around the world, and I think that yeah. that's the way to go forward. Uh, and it's a revolutionary thing. No, I don't know of any non-government organizations, uh, marine government organizations, that have done that. And uh, and so I, I think it's going to be very very successful. And and Sea Shepherd has grown very much since we started the Whale War series. Now the Whale War series actually how that again is because we understood the media. Uh, I went to all the networks 2004, 2005, and I said, look, uh, the biggest show on Discovery right now is Deadliest Catch. A bunch of guys going out every week to some very cold and remote waters to catch crabs. I can give you men and women from all over the world going into colder, more hostile waters to save whales. It's got to be more compelling than catching crabs every week. And so, so they went for it. So it became the number one show on, on Animal Planet uh, from 2007 until 2000. And 17 it was like 10 years on that yeah and uh and, and and of course people say how come you're not on tv anymore I said well because we won there's japanese aren't in the southern ocean anymore so there's no more need for that but it was actually a, a an authentic reality show because animal planet couldn't tell us what to do there was no script and we couldn't tell them how to edit we said you're, you're free to edit it the way you want you, you're free to film whatever you want but uh we don't do what you want us to do. We're not there. I know that they tried in many cases to try and uh, foment, uh, you know, a conflict amongst the crew, you know, because they like that with, you know, they had that with the deadliest sketch, you know, try to get this. Well, this person said this about you. And, but I had, I, I, I cautioned all the crew prior to that. I said, they're going to pull all kinds of games like that. Just don't fall for it. You know, they just want to cause divisions in order to, uh, to that. I said, we got a job to do. They can film the job we're going to do, but we're not going to play their silly games. I know Alex uh, Cornelison, when he was captain on the uh, Bob Barker, did something really funny because uh, so the same crew that were filming, some of the same crew were filming Animal Planet, also dead, Deadliest Catch. And there was one cameraman on Deadliest Catch who uh, got um, one who, who uh, was on there because uh, the captain said to him, give me a goddamn coffee. 
And uh, and he says, I'm not your secretary. Give me a fucking coffee right now. And uh, so he went and did it. So Alex couldn't resist it. And the guy came on board. He says, hi, I'm John. He says, yeah, well, give me a fucking cup of coffee right now. <laughs> <laughs> of course, they're just joking with him. but <laughs> Yeah, I love it. <laughs> um, so we're talking, you, you've got 10 ships in your fleet. Mm. There's one behind you. Um, and how many ships have you sunk like not you personally like sea shepherd and not sunk maybe uh, you know this guy that you were chasing sunk his own ship how many instances of like that plus you ramming them and sinking them and all that kind of stuff have you got numbers for that uh, in 1979 uh, i hunted down uh, and rammed the pirate uh, whaler of the sierra off of portugal and uh we sank it in february 1980 in lisbon harbor after it had been repaired it was a million dollars repairs and then we sank it uh, the Cape Fisher, we shut that down in April of 1980. The Isba 1 and Isba 2, two of the four Spanish ships we sank in Beagle Harbor in 1980. And uh, so in six months, we were able to shut down all the pirate whaling operations uh, in, the, uh, in the Atlantic. Uh, in 92, we scuttled the Senate in Norway. Uh, no, the Nebrena, in, sorry, in 92 was the Nebrena in Norway, and then in 94, the Senate two whaling ships. Now there are about 80 whaling ships in Norway and there, we couldn't sink them all. So the reason we did what we did was uh, by sinking that and publicizing them, we raised all of those vessels had to get war insurance that they're going to be insured. We raised mm. premiums astronomically because of that. So that was the whole point of, of doing that. So two, there were three altogether in Norway. In Norway. And jeez, uh, after, I don't think we sunk any more after that, except for the, you know, the, the thunder, which is, uh, sank itself, really. Uh, yeah. But, uh, you know, we don't go, we, it wasn't our intention to go out and deliberately ram these ships, but it was the only tactics for those particular vessels that we could, uh, that we could think of at the time. And, uh, oh yeah, we sank half of Iceland's whaling fleet in 1986 too. Now that was interesting because not only did we sink half the fleet, but we openly said that we sank half the fleet. And um, I said, well, what are the charges? And they never responded. So I flew to Reykjavik in uh, January of 1988, actually. And I said, well, look, you know, I've been asking you what the charges are. You haven't responded to me. So I'm here to uh, answer to that. And the chief immigration officer, officer said, how long do you intend to stay in Iceland? I said, I don't know, five minutes, five days, five years. Hey, you tell me, you know. Um, so then we went to interrogations. I said, he said, we have to go to interrogation. I said, oh, that sounds like fun. So we're going to interrogation. And he said, are you admitting to sinking these ships? Yeah, of course I'm admitting to it. We'll sink the other two at the first opportunity. The next day they put me on a plane and sent me back to New York. And the, uh, minister of, um, the chief justice minister, the minister of justice, uh, stood up in the parliament that morning and says, who the hell does he think he is? comes into our country and demands to be arrested. Get him out of here. They knew that to put me on trial would be to put Iceland on trial for their illegal whaling activities. That's mm -hmm. the last thing they wanted. So when people said, well, you committed a crime, an act of terrorism, I said, well, really? I wasn't charged. If there's no charge, how can there be a crime? Yeah, that's, that's amazing. See, I can't believe you flew there and you, were just, you would have just taken it on the chin, whatever they said, stay here for well, X yeah. amount of time. We've always said that we take uh, responsibility for what we do. Mm. I remember I was running for uh, I was running for parliament uh, in Canada when that happened uh, for Vancouver Centre member of parliament, and with the Green Party, <laughs> and the Green Party uh, was trying to remove me as a candidate because of that action. And uh, actually, the head of the Green Party there was a former Greenpeace guy, one of the Quakers, Ben Metcalf, and. Uh, he said, well, you know, Greenpeace uh, cannot condone violence of any kind. And I said, well, nothing violent about it. It's a piece of metal, really. And they said, no, we consider it violence. I said, okay, here, let me put it this way. What is the Green Party's position on abortion? You're, well, for a woman's right to choose. Yes, that's, correct. that's right. I have no problem with that. But you can't say it's nonviolent, you know. So how can you say that if killing a fetus is nonviolent, but sinking a piece of metal into the sea is violent? I mean, come on, let's get our priorities right. And uh, so anyway, they couldn't kick me out of the party for that. Also because they had this stupid thing called consensus. And I says, I don't know, I, not everybody's going to agree on this. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. And here's the thing, I've got more votes than any of them. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I bet, yeah, with the publicity and everything and yeah, actually doing something. Uh, yeah, I'm not surprised. Um, 
Tell me about, we talked about a few of them, but are there any other really, you know, memorable experiences from your time with Sea Shepherd, like that, that jump out at you, particular campaigns or moments on ships or anything oh. like that? Because I've seen some crazy moments that you've been through, like where you've been dipped into the ice cold water, hanging off the edge of an illegal whaling boat or whatever, and all sorts of different things. <laughs> and hundreds of campaigns. I'm 1983, we blockaded St. John's Harbor, kept the sealing fleet from leaving. Couldn't do that kind of stuff today, but uh, you know, we dropped uh, hundreds of, of um, caltrops made out of railway uh, rail uh, in the Grand Banks to uh, stop the drag trawling. We, uh, uh, we actually ch- stopped the Spanish and Cuban drag trawlers right there and got arrested for that. I got charged with mischief, but I won the case in court. Um, yeah. So the, in fact, that was the first time I got to use the uh, World Charter for Nature as a defense. Now, I was arrested on three counts of mischief, two counts of mischief endangering life, one count of mischief endangering property. That campaign, I didn't, I damaged no property and injured nobody, but I could have. So that was the basis of the chart. I could have. Mm -hmm. So I was facing two times life plus 10 on those charges. Now, the, the Newfoundland, and I hear I'm in, I'm on trial in a province in Canada where everybody hates me because of opposition to the seal hunt. So I learned an awful lot about that campaign and from that campaign. So they brought out the chief prosecutor to come after me in the court. We had a, we had a jury. And uh, I remember that the, the, the St. John's Evening Telegram, the uh, newspaper there said, everybody in the trial seemed to be under extreme stress, except for the defendant who appeared to be having a good time. <laughs> So anyway, what happened is that I used the World Charter for Nature, uh, that I had the right to do this. That was my my defense. But I also had a good lawyer. And this is something else I learned is if you're going to get in trouble, get the best gun in town anytime. So when I got arrested there, I called a friend of mine who was a lawyer in Vancouver. I says, who's the best damn lawyer in Newfoundland? He said, oh, Brian Casey got those priests off on the orphanage scandal. OK, he's my guy. So uh, and the guy was an artist, he was a total artist. Here, here's his opening statement to the jury. Ladies and gentlemen of the jury, we're not going to say we didn't do this. We're going to say we did do it. We're proud to have done it, and we intend to do it again. That was his opening <laughs> trial. And uh, so Canada brought in um, a law professor to argue that the World Charter for Nature had no validity under Canadian law. And the judge said, yeah, well, did Canada sign this? Well, yeah, but Canada signs a lot of things. <laughs> So the judge said, well, if it's Canada signed it, I'm going to have to allow the jury to, to look at it. Yeah. Now, the thing with the jurors, I learned, too, is that evidence means nothing when you have a jury. It means absolutely nothing. It's they either like you or they don't like you. And uh, of the 12 jurors, the two that I thought were really going to go after me were the two old fishermen. I was totally wrong. Ten of them were against me. Those two were for me. Now, why really? the old fishermen? Well, one because I just ch- I just chased the Cuban and Spanish drag trawlers off of the wa- out of their waters, and two and two they hated the government. They might not have liked me, but they hated the government, and uh, you know so they're going to get their, their their back on the government. So you know when the jury walks in and the jurors don't look at you, you're probably guilty, and if you look at you, you're probably okay. But these guys looked at me and went like that, you know. <laughs> so uh, so I got I was uh, found not guilty on on that. I love that. Um, I really want to get to talking about conservation a bit more and, and ocean marine life and things like that. But just two last things I want to mention to you is the the experience with like the Var- Varadero, um, that campaign. Was that one you were involved with? Yeah. And and then in, I think when you got arrested in Germany in 2012 and you had this insane great escape, uh, like 28,000 miles with no papers, something like that. That began in 2002. Uh, well, actually, it began in 2001. We assisted the rangers at Cocos Island in arresting an Ecuadorian longliner that had just killed five or 600 sharks. And uh, they wouldn't have been able to arrest them without us. So we are actually heroes in Costa Rica for that. And I was actually invited to Costa Rica to work with the rangers. And on my way down, I found a Costa Rican longliner in Guatemalan waters, shark finning. So I contacted the Guatemalan government and they said, could you stop them? And I said, okay. So it was in Guatemalan waters. We didn't hurt anybody. We didn't damage anybody, anything. Uh, they sideswiped into us, but that was, was no damage on it. And so we stopped, didn't think anything of it until we got to Punta Arenas in Costa Rica. And um, I was boarded by the police and charged with eight counts of attempted homicide. So what was that all about? And uh, 
Well, we had Rob Stewart on board. He was making the film Sharkwater and he had filmed everything. So I wasn't too concerned about it. We went into the Costa Rican court. They looked at the footage and dropped the charges. No problem. I go back to my ship. A week later, I get boarded again and arrested again, this time on eight counts of assault. So we go back into court, show the film, a uh, new judge, new ju a new uh, prosecutor, uh, drop the charges, and I'm given clearance to leave. You can leave. Fine. Good. Wonderful. No problem. Over and done with. Ten years later, I arrive in Germany on the way to the Cannes Film Festival, and uh, the Germans arrest me on an, a warrant from Costa Rica because now they had decided to charge me with... Uh, uh, what was it? Uh, shipwreck endangerment. Don't even know what that is, but that's what they're going to charge me with. And uh, so the Germans held me uh, on under house arrest. I had to report to the police every day for two months. And during that time, Japan asked for extradition, requ a request for extradition. So on the last day of July, uh, on Friday, I get a call from a supporter in the German Ministry of Justice in Berlin. He said, when you go in to report to the police on Monday, they're going to uh, seize you and you're going to be extradited to Japan. I said, well, that's not going to happen. So uh, I arranged to leave. The Germans had my uh, Canadian and American passport. So I had uh, one of our boats pick me up in the Netherlands, cross the border into the Netherlands. That took me across the Atlantic to uh, where I illegally went ashore in Nova Scotia. But because I was raised on a border town, I knew how to get across the border. So I crossed into the U.S. I didn't have any papers at all. Crossed into the U.S., then crossed the United States to Los Angeles, had my boat, the Bridget Bardot, meet me off Catalina Island. Uh, Jean-Paul de Joria had his little boat uh, there, uh, got me out to Catalina Island. And then the Bridget Bardot took me to American Samoa, where I then resumed command on the Steve Irwin. And then we went down to Antarctica and done, did that campaign. After the campaign came back and uh, from March until October, I was pretty much in exile in the southern Pacific Islands, Vanuatu, uh, Tonga, the Great Barrier Reef. And that spent the, that time until uh, John Kerry, who was the new Secretary of State, uh, allowed me to come back into the United States. The reason that I had to do this in the first place is I was coming to the U.S. on my boat, but then Hillary Clinton made it quite clear that I would be sent to Japan. So uh, that's why I didn't land in the U.S. directly. Yeah. So yeah. Uh, John Kerry took a look at the evidence. Now, the reason the evidence that the Japanese had was this. In 2011, a vessel working with us, not one of our vessels, called the Audi Gill, was rammed and destroyed by a Japanese uh, uh, whaling boat. And... Uh, the captain was uh, arrested, Pete Bethune, and taken to Japan and charged with uh, trespassing. And uh, he made a deal with the prosecutor. And that deal was if he accused me of ordering him to board the vessel, then they would give him a suspended sentence. Now, I'm on camera not only not doing that, I'm on camera advising him not to do it. I said, you're not an Australian citizen. I would only recommend this if you're an Australian citizen because this is Australian waters, it'd be a huge diplomatic problem for Australia, but you're from New Zealand, I don't want you to do it. But anyway, he made that accusation. And uh, suddenly I found myself charged with conspiracy to trespass for what he did. Mm. Now, a year later, uh, he, he then uh, signed an affidavit to the, for the US Justice Department, uh, our lawyers got him to do this, saying he lied to the Japanese. Fine. Now we have an affidavit saying you signed, but the Japanese weren't going to respect that at all. That's all they had. And that's what they're going to go with. Uh, but John Kerry got it. And uh, he said, well, this is bullshit. So uh, he, he allowed me to come back into the U.S. So I can go to France and I can come back to the U.S., but uh, I'm still on the Interpol red list uh, today. Really, I mean, there's I'm the only person on that list for <laughs> conspiracy to trespass. You know, there are 78,000 registered gangsters in Japan and not one of them is on the list. <laughs> you obviously crossed the line far too much than the more than the gangsters you know far too uh, far too dangerous well, we um, what do you think <laughs> we embarrass them you know you don't yeah japanese are an extremely proud bunch and they take that very stuff very very seriously uh so we shame them yeah what do you think they would do to you if uh if somebody did manage to extradite you if you did turn up on their shores and they got their hands on you I don't think they actually want me there. I think they want me on the list, but they don't want me there because they've made no attempt to extradite me while I was in France or in the U.S. Uh, yeah. But they just—it's it, just, it, it's just a, a way of harassment. 
Uh, mm. I think the last thing they would want is to put me on trial in, in Japan. But, yeah. uh, you know, it's like you said about the other country it would bring, I guess, too much negative publicity as well. Show up what they're doing, shine a light on them in a way. Yeah. But also the problem with Japan is that, uh, their justice system is not, you know, it's got a 95% conviction rate mm. as, uh, mm. you know, you just aren't not going to get a fair trial. Uh, yeah. In, now our, uh, our campaign to stop the Tai Taiji dolphin, uh, slaughter is a good example of that we were disrupting that every year and then finally uh japan just passed a law anybody associated with 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 sea shepherd is not allowed to enter japan i mean that's so really so we could send our people there clandestinely but once they were there then they were registered as somebody who was doing it they could never come back in again so mm -hmm. all of all the all the uh co-guardian veterans are banned from from going to Japan. So basically I ran out of leaders to, to, to go there and do this, uh, yeah. but that's their way of dealing. So that's the kind of country you're dealing with. It's a, a lot of, uh, it's basically a lot of authoritarianism there. Mm. Yeah. And that dolphin hunt, I guess, leads us on to sea spiracy and then ocean conservation in general. Yeah. Um, so first of all, on the documentary, like what were your thoughts on it and why does everybody need to watch it? Well, we co-produced that. We put about fifty thousand dollars into to make. Oh, cool! That. And it all came out of um, uh, cowspiracy originally that we were in mm. before, and uh, they also produced a sea spiracy. So we met with Ellie Tabrizi and saw where this was going. It was a story that had to be told, uh, but you know he just certainly deserves full credit for this. And the reason it was successful was that. Uh, it's a person's story and people can relate to stories and it's also on Netflix. So the combination of his story and being on Netflix made it really a big, a big thing. And, mm -hmm. uh, you know, the fishing industry attacked it before they had even seen it. Oh, it's full of lies. Well, they haven't even seen it. Uh, and after they said, I said, well, where, tell me where there's a single uh, piece of misinformation in there. And they never, ever say, <laughs> they just say it's full of lies. Uh, the one thing they do say is, well, you know, you had this study by Dr. Boris Worm that says that uh, fisheries will collapse by 2048. Uh, and Boris Worm retracted that. I said, yeah, he did. But then he rewrote it and said 2060. So what's the hell? Well, does that really make a difference between 48 and 20? Yeah, 12, 12 years. Yeah. yeah. And, uh, and he said it'd, it'd be like a, you know, a 48% decline or something by such and such period. Personally, I think Boris Worm was being quite optimistic. Uh, my personal prediction is, is, is that uh, commercial pictures will collapse by 20, 30, 35. Wow. Yeah, that's soon, isn't it? And that's going to fly around. Talk to me about some of the, the ways of destructive, the most destructive types of fishing. Well, they're all any uh, industrialized heavy gear technology is what's destroying the ocean. At COP21 mm -hmm. in Paris, I said, look, if you really want to address climate change, you got to save the ocean. And the best way to do that is to shut down, have a complete moratorium on all industrial fishing operations as of today. That's what's destroying the ocean. So that ranges from 100 mile long long lines, 100 mile long gill nets, giant purse seine nets, bottom drag trawlers. All of these things are causing incredible amounts of damage, super trawlers, things like this. Also, the subsidization of the fishing industry is what's keeping this going. It couldn't survive on its own. Uh, $76 billion a year goes into subsidizing industrialized fishing. Uh, Europe is, is, is actually subsidizing the plundering of the fish resources in the African waters. You know, so this is, and so that, that's one of the real, the real problems there. Um, yeah. You know, for hundreds and hundreds of years, the uh, shamans in French Polynesia, they had this thing called uh, kapu, and these were laws. And the kapu laws, for instance, would say no fishing in this bay in Bora Bora or in Hanama Bay in Hawaii. Anybody caught fishing in that 20 year period, death penalty. And people say, well, that's a little extreme, but not from their point of view. They knew that if the fish disappeared, the people would die. It's a matter of survival. And so they took it very seriously. So they had capital punishment for anybody who broke the Kapu laws, which made mm -hmm. perfect sense. Today, there are no Kapu areas anywhere in the world. Uh, we have sanctuaries and marine reserves, but that's where the poachers go. <laughs> you know, without, without enforcement, they're, they're, they're meaningless. 
Rayathon, uh, the fish finding company that produces fish finder, you know, and uh, what, what the motto of the fish finder is the fish can run, but they can't hide. And that's the problem. We use not only yeah. these super industrialized operations, but we're, we use satellites to find fish. We use all sorts of electronic surveillance to find fish, fish aggregating devices. We've confiscated hundreds of fish aggregating devices in the Mediterranean just uh, this year alone. Uh, so I firmly believe that uh, if, if, if fish populations collapse, the oceans will die. And if the oceans die, we die too. Since 19... Um, 50, and this can be verified through, there's a great article in Scientific America on this. Since 1950, we've seen a 40% diminishment in phytoplankton populations in the sea. Phytoplankton provides up to 70% of the air, of the oxygen in the air we breathe. Rainforest, you know, are less than, there's less than 30%, but here's, phytoplankton provides mostly oxygen. But why has it been diminished? Because of the diminishment of sea life. Uh, every day, one blue whale defecates three tons into the sea, have very rich in nutrients like iron and uh, nitrogen. These are the nutrients required by phytoplankton. When you reduce sea life, you reduce the nutrient supply to the phytoplankton populations, the, the aquatic plant life. And uh, that then reduces not only the amount of oxygen produced, but it also removes one of the greatest sequesters of carbon on the planet, which is phytoplankton. So we're destroying the, in destroying the ocean, we're, we're really committing suicide to, with ourselves. I always like to put it this way. If, if you look at the planet for what it is, it's a spaceship. The earth is a spaceship. It's on this incredible voyage around the Milky Way galaxy at incredible speeds. And um, every spaceship has a life support system, which provides us with the air we breathe, regulates climate and temperatures and the food we eat. And the ocean is that life support system. And that life support system is run by a crew of engineers that maintain everything, all the systems, everything from insects and bacteria to algae, to uh, trees, to, you know, to, the, to the great whales. There are all these engineers. And what we human beings, what are we? We're the passengers. We're having a wonderful time amusing ourselves, entertaining ourselves. But one of the things we're doing is murdering crew members. We're killing them off. And there's only so many of these engineers you can kill before the system begins to collapse. A world without bees, a world without uh, certain bacteria, a world without, you know, this is, this is all going to cause a collapse. In mm -hmm. 2005, I wrote an article about this, about how uh, I had just read in 1995, I had read Laurie Garrett's book, uh, The Coming Plague. And uh, where she predicted these emerging zoonomic transmission of viruses. And for the most part, we ignored it. Ebola, Zika, uh, West Nile, Hanta. We ignored all these things. These are all new diseases. But suddenly COVID hits. Now, this is a disease that kills white people. <laughs> you know, we're not going to be ignoring that one. And, uh, but it was predictable right from, 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 the, from, from the word go. And there's going to be new emerging uh, zoonomic transmitted viruses because as you diminish ecosystems and diminish species, the viruses associated with those species uh, are going to have to go somewhere. They have to jump. They'll jump to another species. And those closely related to us, like bats and pigs and birds and things like that, they're going to jump to us because we're very attractive, 8 billion of us. That's where the viruses are going to want to, want to go. And mm -hmm. zoonomic, trans, zoonomic uh, problem, transmission is also caused by um, factory farms, uh, wet markets. But fac factory farms, you know, every year, not many people pay attention to the fact that millions and millions of animals are, are euthanized on factory farms to stop the spread of these viruses. They killed 17 million mink in in Denmark just last year because of COVID. Yeah. And now deer have got COVID in North America. And so the future means as diminishment is going to cause more and more viruses. Plus added to that is the emerging pathogens coming out of that have been long dormant in permafrost because of, of melting. So the future is going to be the biggest threat, I think, to our survival immediately is going to be these new emerging uh, viruses coming out of the uh, out of this. People don't really understand viruses. I mean, viruses are absolutely essential for life on this planet. Every plant, every animal has viruses associated with it, which actually help maintain healthy systems within ourselves. But it's when you have another virus associated with one species jumping into you, another species, that's where you have the problem. 
we have one of our campaigns called Operation uh, Virus Hunter, which is uh, to uh, study the transmission of uh, zoonomic transmission of viruses between farm-raised salmon and indigenous salmon populations in the West Coast. So we're seeing a decline of seven species of indigenous salmon because of the salmon farms, because this Atlantic mm. salmon, which doesn't belong there, in concentrated conditions is creating these, uh, these uh, viruses, which are being push, put into the, into the ecosystem. So we're really the cause of our own demise. I've always said, look, you know, this is not about saving the planet. This is, you know, planet will do just fine. Uh, this is about saving ourselves from ourselves. If you look mm -hmm. at any, uh, at the history of um, um, mass exterminations uh, in mass extinction events over the history of the planet, we're, there's been five, uh, but we're now in the sixth called the Holocene because we're responsible for it. But what did those, they all have in common? All those mass extinction events were caused by excesses of carbon in the in the atmosphere and the other thing they had in common was that it took 18 to 20 million years to recover from the event so no matter what we do in 18 to 20 million years this will still be a beautiful planet we just won't be here <laughs> yeah 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 definitely i mean that's what it is isn't it that saving the planet is saving life on the planet right now like the life that's here at the moment because, yeah, you're absolutely right. Regardless of what, no matter, even if we set off every single nuke we've got, one day it's going to be back to, uh, to normal just without us. <laughs> well, there's three, there's three basic laws of ecology. No species has ever existed on this planet outside of those three basic laws of ecology. The first is the law of diversity. The strength of an ecosystem lies in diversity. The second is the law of interdependence, that all the species within an ecosystem are interdependent with each other. And the third is the law of finite resources. There's a limited growth because there's a limited re resources. And when you steal the resources or the carrying capacity of other species, that, I mean, what that does is cause the diminishment in all in interdependence and in diversity. And so it's a, it's a vicious circle that way. So that's what yeah. we're, we're doing. We're living, we're taking too many resources, stealing those resources from other species and causing diminishment. Yeah. And we've put, we've taken the limiter off of the most destructive species of all, which is us. And we're just out of control. I would say. Yeah. We, well, <laughs> this is why I feel that. Uh, yeah, the, really, the problem is a philosophical one. As for the last 10,000 years, we've developed this uh, attitude called anthropocentrism, uh, as opposed to biocentrism, which indigenous cultures still recognize. Uh, this idea of anthropocentrism is that we're the center of everything. We're the only species that matter. All, everything was created just for us. And that is what's going to destroy us. Uh, biocentrism says we're part of everything. We're, we're you know, interdependent with everything else. And uh, unless we learn to live in harmony with all those other species, then we're simply not going to survive. But we've been so indoctrinated into these anthropocentric uh, ideas that uh, we're all important, the only important species. You know, a couple of years ago, a reporter, Brett Hume from Fox News called me up and he says, I heard that you said that worms, trees, bees, and fish were more important than people. I see, yeah, I did say that. How could you say something so outrageous? I said, well, I said it because worms, trees, bees, and fish are more important than people for the simple reason they can live here without us, but we can't live here without them. We need them. They, they don't need us. Yeah. Uh, that's, that really illustrates those ecological, ecological laws. We do not live on this planet by ourselves. Mm. At the University of Texas, giving a talk one time, and says, you know, we don't need other species. Humans, got, we have technology. We can do this. We can survive and everything. I said, well, first of all, I'm looking at you. What am I looking at? He said, well, I'm a human being. I said, no, you're not. You're, a, you're um, a symbiont is what you are. Right now in your body, there's 1,700 species of bacterium. You know, uh, there's viruses. They, a great part, weight of your part of the weight of your body are non-human things. You mm. couldn't live without them. They need you. You need them. So don't try and tell me you're independent that uh, you can survive without them because you can't. You can't even digest your food without them. You can't even clean your eyebrows without them. You need them, <laughs> you know? But, yeah. for the, but it's all out of sight and out of mind and people don't really understand that, uh, that relationship. They don't understand the importance of microbes, the importance of, uh, which really, when you get right down to it, microbes are the single most dominant species, on, a group of species on the planet. They, they run everything. <laughs> yeah. And it's like you said, we're the passengers. We, everything would be fine if whether we're here or not. Uh, we need to try and keep it harmonious with it, with everything else, living in peace with everything else. <laughs> but we're doing the opposite every, of that, unfortunately. Every single major religion on this planet 
is anthropocentric. It puts humans mm -hmm. at the center of everything. It says that humans are all that matters. Every single one of them says that. And yet yeah. you look at the history of the planet, we've only been around by mere seconds in, in, in that history. Yeah, yeah. Can you talk just for a few minutes about like bycatch? I don't know if that's something that's talked about that much. I mean, it's starting to get talked about a lot more. Um, but it's it basically every every fishing industry or every fisher fishery um, will have bycatch pretty much. No, well, except for indigenous fisheries where you know you get yeah one on one. But uh, yeah, industrial, industrial. It has a huge amount of bycatch. The shrimp industry is twenty two kilos for every one kilo caught. Uh, in addition to, uh, you know, the French trawling fleets killing probably about 10,000 dolphins a year there. Uh, so as bycatch, yeah, as bycatch. Uh, so uh, the, the Bikita thing, the Bikita is nothing more than a, a bycatch of the Totoaba fishery. And the Totoaba itself is an endangered species, but the swim bladder of the Totoaba is worth $20,000 a kilo in Japan, in China. So for mm -hmm. that reason, uh, there's a lot of uh, demand. Uh, there's a lot of motivation to go and get Totoaba and the bycatch is the uh, Bikita of which is probably only about a dozen left in the, on the planet anymore. Uh, the, yeah. the Hector and Maui dolphins are dying because of bycatch in the New Zealand fisheries, for example. So, uh, yeah, it's it's a major problem. Yeah, it's just there's so many problems at once, isn't it? You've got like the bycatch, you've got all the other problems with uh, destructive types of fishing. You've got whaling, you've got shark finning, and all these kind of things all have, as well as pollution and plastic pollution and well, you have everything that. like that. And acidification, climate warm, global warming, all of these things are are having a huge uh, a huge impact you know we focus on plastic pollution you know plastic bags plastic, plastic straws and everything but uh, the real problem is microplastics and uh that's get, that microplastics get ingested into fish that get eaten by animals including our cells and gets into our bodies it's even been found in zooplankton uh, yeah but microplastic comes from so many different sources every every time a car goes down the road it loses microscopic pieces of uh from the tire Billions and billions and billions of these of these pieces get washed down into the ocean. A study in Norway showed that a huge percentage of the microplastic were automobile tires. You know, really? people don't even think about that part of it. No, you know. no, I hadn't thought of that. That's terrifying. Apparently, there's this microplastics in fetuses now, aren't there? In human fetuses. I yes. don't know if you've heard that, but I, I heard that in a few studies recently. Yes, it's getting, it's it's getting everywhere. Terrifying. My, yeah. it's it's a it's a it's a toxic substance that. Uh, you know, and all, all I ever hear, oh, we're going to go clean up the Great Pacific Garbage Patch. That's the least of the problem. So that stuff is, mm. see that stuff, <laughs> you know. Yeah, yeah. But we do. We have, I guess. We, 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 you know, one of the things that we've been doing is removing literally thousands of tons from remote beaches and from islands and everything around the world. But mm. you can't really dispose of this stuff very, very well. No. And I mean, with the size of the problem, I think it's it, like at this point, we need governments and media and the corporations on mass don't we really to to actually want to do something about it um at least I, and this is the scary thing is that money talks doesn't it like you i think you i think it was you that said this or maybe it was a documentary like seaspiracy but there's money to be made by driving species extinct i think i think it might have been yourself the economic um, but i'm not sure and there was an example given in the thing i watched and it's yeah that there's a company or i don't know if it's a company or a country keeping large quantities of frozen tuna um in their freezers whilst continuing to fish it heavily where they could sell the frozen tuna give the actual fish in the sea a break for a bit and let it kind of replenish but no they keep it frozen they keep continue to fish it to drive the price up mm -hmm. and the numbers down yeah, it's, it's, uh, it's called the economics of extinction yeah that's it's, it's with every species the, the the scarcer the species the more valuable it is in the market so um, that's like all of the fisheries you know i when i was a child living in a fishing village uh, lobsters were dirt cheap you know uh yeah back in the 1890s 1900s lobsters were called the poor man's meat um you know in fact there's laws in new england making it illegal to feed lobsters to your servants <laughs> it's considered <laughs> wow. uh, you know uh, lobsters were caught in prince Edward island primarily to fertilize the potato fields that's how really? plentiful they are. But now uh, scarcity translates into into a, uh, to a lot of profit. I mean, I look at the price of fish in fish markets today. It's just uh, mind boggling and people just accept it. And Because the other problem we have as humans is this constant adaptation to diminishment. 
as things become diminished, we just sort of accept it. What can you do? You know, really like in 1965, for instance, if I were to say, you know, in the future, you're going to be buying water in plastic bottles and paying more for that water than the equivalent amount of gasoline. You look at me and like, who would be that stupid? You know, we're not going to pay for water and it's not that kind of money. And today, you know, I remember being in a hotel in New York and I saw there's a liter of water beside the bed. You can buy this liter for $12. Just put it on your bill. Mm. $12 a liter, that's $48 a gallon in a country where it was two fifty dollars per gallon of gasoline. <laughs> and yet yeah. we don't, we just accept it. We don't say anything about, you know, we just accept whatever is given to us on that. It's the adaptation to diminishment um, where for instance, you know, uh, going to Cocos Island, one of the great dive spots of the world, people say, oh, my God, it's so incredibly beautiful here. I said, yeah, but it's not as beautiful as it was 20 years ago or 30 years ago. But this is what you see now. But you didn't see what was there before. And so but this because this is what you see now, this is what you think that reality is. And you just adapt to it. Ten years time from now, it'll be diminished and people will come dive and say, oh, this is incredible. But it isn't, <laughs> you know, it, you, it, we're going to get excited to a point. We're going to get excited if anybody sees a crab on the bottom of the ocean. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Or a, a wasp flying around. Yeah. Well, that's like that. Because it's the same with insects. Yeah. The other thing, you know, I remember you drive down the road, you know, you always had to clean your windshield. From, you know, yeah. That, that doesn't happen anymore, you know. No, this is just what I was thinking. Because we drove, like I was mentioning, we drove from France to the UK recently and it was like an over 12 hours, well over 12 hours total driving. And our windscreen was virtually clear, you know, like no, no dead insects or anything like that. And it's just crazy you know, that in such a short space of time, mm -hmm. the change in that. Well, is... you got, you got bactericides, fungicides, insecticides, pesticides, herbicides, <laughs> you know, all those. Yeah. And all that stuff ends up in the ocean. Uh, yeah. Agriculture is a single main cause of dead zones in the ocean, a single cause of groundwater pollution. And, uh, you know, and it's not just, it's not the meat industry, which is probably the most destructive part about it, but uh, it's all of the chemicals that are used in crops and that also. Yeah, dear, dear. Um, here's a big question. Should people eliminate fish from their diet I or, think, or significantly reduce? I think that, that we ha should have a moratorium on, uh, on, on the eating of fish. We need to allow the ocean time to repair the damage that it's done to it and we also understand yeah. that the value of fish is more than just being uh, something on your plate uh it's part of an ecosystem which uh it, it's all held together and uh, we can't keep removing species after species without having repercussions the world without sharks is not going to be a very healthy ocean that we need no. um and again we adapt to it back in 1990s you go into any fish market you could buy an orange roughy you don't see it anymore this is a species that takes 45 years to become sexually mature. This to be 200 years of age. Can't keep up with our demand. And so it just disappears and we move on to something else. You don't hear a black cod anymore. You don't, there's so many species of fish that I used to see when I was younger that are not available anymore. And if they are extremely high prices because of, of that. And also the problem is, is the higher the fish is on the food chain, the more mercury, methyl mercury that you find in the, in the, in the fish, the more toxic it, it is. And everybody yeah. talks about, you know, the toxicity of, uh, of the mercury in pilot whales and the Faroe Islands and the, and the, and the threat to the health of the Faroes, but nobody talks about the health of the pilot whales <laughs> that, the, yeah. that if they got such high levels of mercury, what's it doing to them? Mm. Mm, yeah, absolutely. It's scary really, isn't it? It is scary. And, and it's scary that it's happening on so many levels. Like you kind of touched on, like it's the crops and the pesticides and then they come into the ocean and we're already putting all the plastic in the ocean. And then we're also taking all the life out of the ocean. We're also cutting down all the life on, on the earth. And it's just, we're coming at it from every single angle. Um, yeah. And it's, well, yeah. politicians are incapable of doing anything about it because yeah. politics is the art of the possible and what we're now is faced with impossible problems i say that the solution to an impossible problem is to find the impossible answer and that mm. can be found through passion courage and imagination but that isn't those are not traits that politicians have they have mm. to you know they have to the bottom line for them is to get elected in the next election or whatever a good example, the conservative prime minister of Canada in 1980, uh, Joe, Joe Clark, he actually said, look, you know, we really have people should really pay the real price of gasoline because this is hugely subsidized. And uh, he was going to actually raise the price of gasoline to reflect what the value of it is. I mean, for instance, in Europe, you pay a lot more for gasoline or petrol than you do here. Uh, 
he was gone within six months. <laughs> you know? mm. Any politician who's going to take concrete action to actually lower carbon emissions is going to be removed from office. Yeah. Yeah. Because it doesn't fit the, the system. It doesn't well, fit the way Everybody wants work. to change, but nobody wants to change. No, because I guess it's the problem is the people that can actually make the change are the people that profit from the status quo. I guess. And I think large swathes, maybe not the entirety of it, but large swathes of the, the kind of mainstream or the media are afraid to call it out. Then, you know, you don't see, it should be headlines every day, the things that we're doing to the planet, but it's not. It's just when something like COP26 or whatever is happening, then it's in the news. Well, COP26, uh, you know, the 26 of these things hasn't, hasn't produced anything but promise. Cop out 26. Promises, yeah. promises, promises. That's all you ever get out of it. You know, I went to, yeah. uh, to the Rio conference, uh, uh, the, the United Nations Conference on the Environment and Development, it was called in 1992. Every single promise from that conference, not one of them has materialized. You know, it's, it's, it's the same. They, mm. These are just photo opportunities for world leaders. They'll make all the promises in the world. I mean, I thought that David Attenborough said everything that needed to be said at COP26 and all these world leaders are nodding their heads and agreeing and everything, but not one of them is going to listen. To, not, not one of them is going to do no. anything. They've been being told this for half a century now, right? They've been being told these kind of things, these kind of warnings for half a century and they've ignored it. And it's just going to, it's always a case of past the buck, I suppose. Even the people in the position to make a change now think, ah, oh, it'll be all right. Well, I'll let my successor do it when I, when I, you know, move on in three years, he'll, he'll do it. And I suppose it's a lot of that, like a lot of shared responsibility, like, oh, they'll, they'll take care of it. Or he'll, he'll do it. I don't want to have to be the one. Well, for any uh, who um, does it, it's political suicide. Yeah. 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 It's, it's a hard one, isn't it? <laughs> Impossible, as some would say. Um, well, what's going to happen in the future is uh, uh, authoritarianism is the only thing that's going to, uh, unfortunately, is the only thing that's going to be able to get around that. And, mm. Not a good thing, but it's probably the only thing that uh, you you have to force these issues. And, and when it comes yeah. to the question of survival of humanity, I think there will be no other choice. Yeah, yeah, I think you're probably right. We probably will box ourselves into a corner, and at the last, very last opportunity, if it's going to happen, then we'll dig ourselves out of the hole there and then um, by throwing our collective might and and brain power at it. Should we finish with a couple of lighter questions? Because I'm conscious of not taking up too much of your day. Um, so one of the things I want to ask you is, I, I saw, again, you mentioned this in, I can't remember which, t I think it was a documentary. I think it was the one called Watson, potentially. Um, but you said in that, given the money, I can't remember the context, but I wanted to kind of take it out of context and ask it in a lighter way. But you said kind of given the money and the, the time or the facilities, maybe we'd be able to communicate with whales and, and elephants. And I just thought that was really interesting. And I thought, yeah, absolutely. Why not? And do you, do you stand by it? Do you think we could? How intelligent do you think they are? And just kind of expand on it a little bit. Well, I, I actually think they're more intelligent than we are. But we, we measure intelligence by hand-eye uh, coordination, by uh, anthropocentric ways of measuring intelligence. Again. Ability to manipulate tools. You know, I was debating this whaler in Norway one time. He says, but Watson, you say that whales are more intelligent than people. This is a stupid thing to say. I said, well, yeah, but George, you know, I, I measure intelligence by the ability to live in harmony with our ecosystems. And by that criteria, they're far more intelligent than we are. He said, well, by that yeah. criteria, cockroaches are more intelligent than we are. I said, George, you're beginning to understand what I'm trying to tell you. <laughs> there is an intelligence that goes through all various species. Ours is a tool making intelligence, but other animals use tools, too, but not to the same extent. But yeah. uh, for, you know, if dinosaurs didn't go extinct, they probably would have evolved into a sort of a bipedal, intelligent, dinosaurian sort of thing, they're doing the same thing we're doing right now, you know. But, uh, yeah. but uh, whales, uh, you know, the largest whale on the planet is the sperm whale brain at 9,000 cubic centimeters. The orca has a brain of 6,000 cubic centimeters compared to the human brain of 1,700 cubic centimeters. The convolutions on the neocortex area of orcas and sperm whales are far, far more pronounced than on human beings. So there's more brain area. Plus all brains from mice to people have four lobes, except for cetacean brains have, I mean, three lobes, cetacean brains have four lobes. And that fourth lobe is all associative behavior, which thought, language, communication. Um, you know, English language has 400,000 words. A humpback, uh, 2 million various identifiable vocal components in there. I think wow. whales communicate with each other similar to the way our computers do. 
by sending large amounts of information in short bursts of um, sound. Uh, and, and in that way, you know, being able to transmit images to each other in that way. Um, mm. Dr. Paul Spong, Dr. Roger Payne have done a lot of uh, work on this. And uh, where formerly people would laugh at it, there's now starting to be taken very, very seriously. You know, we haven't learned a single word of dolphin, but dolphins yeah. have learned English words. <laughs> and yeah. the interesting thing about them when they learned those words is they had learned them six months in advance of actually saying them, but they had to actually learn how to say it slow enough because everything is so fast and at such high frequency, they had to slow it down, you know, say, it'll for more fish, like thing like that. You know, so that, that was a big difference on it, on it. But, um, and also I think, you know, elephants are highly, highly intelligent, but again, it's all relative. You know, if a dog comes into your room there, it could tell you who was there yesterday. We can't do that. So yeah, it's all relevant yeah. to that. I know in biology one-on-one, they always have this whole same thing. You know, here, here's a rat's brain. Here's a dog's brain. Here's a chimpanzee brain. Here's a human brain. You can see that the convolutions of the neocortex of the human are greater than the blah, 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 go down that. And the size of the brain is bigger. Uh, I said, well, you never put an orca brain up there because it makes us look really stupid. We don't like to be looked stupid, so we, do, we just don't, we don't put it up there. And they said, well, it's brain to body weight, you know, because they're big animals, they have big brains. Dinosaurs had small brains, big bodies. And if you did brain to body weight, the hummingbird would be the most intelligent species on the planet, but uh, it, it doesn't work that way. You know, big brains yeah. uh, are big brains and, they, and, they, and, and they're more capable of high, high intelligence. I mean, cetaceans can communicate over hundreds and hundreds of miles with each other under using the water as a, as a medium. Uh, wow. They can see through you, you know, they see through each other. I mean, if, a, if I'm a dolphin looking at you right now, I see your blood moving. I see your heart beating because I'm, I'm seeing with my ears, I'm seeing the, I'm sending the sonar to you. And it's re reflecting just like a sonogram uh, in a hospital. And so we, we now know dolphins have individual names for each other that uh, they actually identify each other with a particular specific name. Uh, mm -hmm. So there's a lot that we're learning there. And I believe that someday, if given the opportunity, uh, and if it's taken seriously enough, we'll be able to, using computers, be able to communicate with them. Yeah. I don't know if, are, wow. I don't know if uh, we're going to be happy with what they have to say. <laughs> yeah, no, probably not. We'll be in for a strict, uh, yeah, a heavy telling off, I imagine. But no, I mean, if, to your point of the intelligence, yeah, how intelligent could we really be? I mean, look what we're doing to the planet, at least as a collective. Uh, maybe it's not intelligence, but... Well, that's yeah. why I say intelligence has to be measured by the ability to live in harmony with the ecosystem that you're with. Yeah, exactly. What is intelligence? That's a hard one to define. We could talk for a while just to well, define yeah. that, I guess. But again, and illustrated how we, we create intelligence with technology. If a blob of protoplasm stepped out of a spaceship tomorrow with a ray gun, oh, wow, it must be an intelligent creature because it's got a gun and it came out of a spacecraft. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah definitely i see um okay so on to the next one so i, I just I, I found out yesterday or I, I came across the information that you once had lunch with the dalai lama and i just wanted to see how was how was the lunch how was it was it <laughs> what was that like well back in 1985 i had two uh, tibetan monks came to my ship in seattle and they had this little wooden statue it looked like a horse-headed dragon with wings and uh, they gave it to me and said, you know, if you put it on your mass, it'd be good fortune and everything. Yeah. So, you know, a couple of Tibetan monks are going to come and give you something. Why not put it up in the mass? Didn't think anything up. Yeah. yeah. But in 1989, I had, did have, uh, I was at a luncheon with the Dalai Lama in Washington, D.C. And uh, I had a picture of this and I showed it to him and found out he had sent it. He had sent it to us. And I said, well, what is it? And he says, oh, it's called Haya Griva. And I said, well, What's that? He says, well, it's the compassionate aspect of the wrath of the Buddha. <laughs> and I said, well, what's that mean? And then he smiled and he said, well, you never want to hurt anybody, but sometimes when they cannot see enlightenment, scare the hell out of them until they do. <laughs> so he understood that that was our approach, you know. That's why I got yeah. the Roger flag and everything like the pirates and whatever, but we're not going to hurt anybody, but they don't know that. I mean, there's stories out there about how Sea Shepherd has killed people and machine gun people at sea and everything else like that. They're just bullshit stories. But, you know, the benefit of those stories scares the hell out of the poachers when you come, when, when you come up. Yeah, I bet. <laughs> 
Yeah, I bet. Hey, you mentioned pirates. Actually, I was going to come back to the idea of pirates and ask you kind of because you've yeah, you've been accused of being pirates by some people before. And of course, they used to be real pirates in the seas. Who are the pirates these days? Is it like the, the, the fishing ships? Is it the governments or who, who is it? Well, the real pirates are the, the vessels that are plundering the coast of Africa right now. We talk about Somali pirates. These are just poor uh, fishermen who have been driven out of work because of the real pirates, the Asian and the mm. fishing fleets, which come down there are still down there plundering those waters but uh what is a pirate really it's uh you know it's <laughs> you know if, if if a government's doing it, it's called it's okay they're called privateers <laughs> if it's an individual then they're, they're they're pirates but we can learn a lot yeah. from the pirates back from the 17th century you know first of all they were way ahead of uh, everybody else in society the first democracies were on pirate ships they elected their captains they had uh, equality amongst gender and race on that uh they're far far ahead of their time and they got things done and in and in like in england for instance where a 10 year old boy could be hung for stealing a loaf of bread it wasn't a big jump to become a pirate and uh you know, when they said, well, they were thieves, I say, yeah, they stole gold from the Spaniards. Where did the Spaniards get their gold? They stole it from the Aztecs. So are you really a thief if you're stealing the gold from the thieves? It's, it's, it's all very complicated on that. But they did cut through the, bureaucr the bureaucracy, the red tape, and they got things done. You know, yeah. Sir Henry Morgan shut down piracy in, uh, in the Caribbean and uh, was rewarded by being made governor of Jamaica. That's when he became a real pirate. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but he joined the other side. Um, look, Paul, this has been this has been awesome. I'll ask you one last thing. And it's just if you have got anything you want to say to anybody watching or listening today, if you've got like a message, uh, it doesn't have to be anything specific, whatever kind of comes to your mind. Um, but if, yeah, if you want to speak for a couple of minutes well, uh, to people. Uh, well, I have one very brief thing to say, and that is uh, what I say all the time is that if the ocean dies, we all die. We don't live on this planet with a dead ocean. It has to be the single most important thing that we need to address is to make sure that we do not kill interdependence and diversity in the ocean if we're going to survive. I guess just to lead on from that then and ask you one last, last thing, it would be what can people that are listening or watching this now do, you know, themselves? Not everybody has the time or ability or, or whatever that can go and join an organization like Sea Shepherd or can go and like, you know, lobby politicians all the time. So what, what can your average person at home do about it to, to help do you think well people should do what they can do best which is that uh, you know harness their passion to courage and imagination to make a difference that means what are your skills what are your abilities and put them into service you could be a lawyer you could be a teacher it doesn't matter whether the approach is legislation education litigation or direct intervention uh, it, it's all working towards the same end the strength of an ecosystem is in diversity the strength of any movement is in diversity so everybody can do their part in, in that way. And when you put it all together, that becomes an ecosystem. And within that movement, you make a difference. So everybody's working towards the same end if they're involved in that. And uh, so but the great thing about it is more and more young people are getting involved on many, many levels. And things are changing, not fast enough, but still changing. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that's the thing. We need to increase the velocity of the change. But yeah, you're right. It's, uh, it's starting to happen. Paul, I really, really appreciate you you taking the time today and talking to me. It was a lot of fun and uh, very enlightening. Um, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for listening to my conversation with Paul Watson. I hope you enjoyed it and learned something from it. Please check out the abundance of links in the description. And if you like the podcast, click subscribe. Be nice. Be happy. Be cool.